Whether you're a hobbyist, programmer, or an experienced one, chances are you only have been using one or two styles of programming for the vast majority of the time. But in fact, out there, there are many different ways in which programming can happen. In today's episode, what we're going to do is we're going to take a closer look at several different styles of programming and to try and better understand what their motivations are. You're watching another Random Wednesday episode on 0612 TV. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So, we've done several list videos before, but I think this one bears some special mention in the sense that, you know, normally when we have a list, the items in the list are mutually exclusive. In this particular video, that is not the case. In fact, you'll find that many styles of programming are actually based on one particular style. It is just that style taken and developed further. So yeah, just to make sure we are on the same page in this regard, make sure you don't think that all the programming styles are mutually exclusive, because they're not. So with that said, let us jump into what is probably the most popular programming style of all. The first style of programming is imperative programming, and this is probably the broadest yet most widely used style of programming. In imperative programming, your program is a list of instructions that basically tell your computer step by step what to do. Chances are, if you're a programmer watching this video, you'll be like, yes, my programs are like that. Because in fact, most of the time, programming is imperative in nature, though we'll find some other styles that are not. Now, the reason why this method is so popular is because of the fact that it very closely mirrors what a computer actually does. Of course, at the low level, all your computer is doing is executing instruction by instruction. At its lowest level, imperative programming is just these instructions that feed directly into your CPU. In other words, it'll probably be something like bytecode or its slightly nicer looking form, assembly language. Of course, neither of these languages are particularly easy or convenient to use, which is why other programming styles have been created on top of this to make life easier for us. This allows us to move on to the second style of programming, called structured programming. Now, this, like I said, is built on top of imperative programming, so yeah, just bear this in mind, structured programming is a form of imperative programming. This particular style of programming introduces code blocks, and that is, well, blocks of code, for example, within curly braces. The whole idea of having this, of course, is to make code easier to read and to give us some additional syntactic sugar for example, loops. This is not to say that without code blocks, we cannot do loops. We can still do them, but we'll have to do them in the style of assembly language programming. What is normally done is you check a parameter. If it's not been fulfilled the way you like it, then you want to jump to an earlier part in the code. What this results in is, well, a loop. A bunch of code will get to execute again and again until a condition is met. So yeah, code blocks just exist to make us not have to do that because that makes code kind of unreadable. And while that's good and all, we are now used to one other type of syntactic sugar that technically is also just jumping around in a bunch of code, and that is the concept of functions. This then allows us to transition to the next style called procedural programming. Once again, procedural programming is based on imperative programming it is in fact a further enhancement of structured programming. So yeah, really I'll draw out you know, these three styles of programming in this manner. Think of it as we are making incremental improvements to what was originally imperative programming. So yeah, in procedural programming, we have access to procedures. Really, these are just abstractions for jumping around in the code, but it makes code much easier to read. Several programming languages actually stop here. And that is, well, they don't actually have any further enhancements to them. And examples of this include C and BASIC. These are both relatively old. Newer programming languages tend to include more styles as we go along. So yeah, let's continue on and see what we have next. We can improve on procedural programming by using what is called object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming makes code even easier to understand by introducing the idea of objects. 
Ultimately, it is just synthetic sugar, it is still just an abstraction for jumping around and things like arrays. But yeah, if we don't think about what this is composed of at a lower level and just what it is by itself, then we can see things as objects. Objects can hold both information as well as methods that operate on that information. Objects can even be extended, you can even create objects based on other objects and tweak those up slightly. There are a lot of things you can do. Languages that place emphasis on object-oriented programming include Java and C++. Switching gears, we can now move on to talk about event-driven programming. Now, whether this is a type of imperative programming or not depends on what language you use to implement this in. Basically, an event-driven program is one that simply includes chunks of code that are only run on certain events. One very classic example of event-driven programming in action is that of a GUI. You have a whole bunch of buttons and you write a whole bunch of code that will support every button click. But none of this code actually runs until a button is clicked. When a button is actually clicked, the relevant chunk of code runs. So yeah, basically, this code is event-driven. Like I said, the most common use case for event-driven programming is in a GUI, even though the same paradigm has been used in areas like creating web servers. So up to this point, for most of you, we are on pretty familiar ground. But now, we're going to move on to talk about declarative programming, which is a completely different way of looking at writing programs. In imperative programming, we tell the computer what to do, step by step. Whereas in declarative programming, we just describe the results we want. In other words, the difference between these two styles of programming is that for imperative programming, we have to describe the how how to do the work. Whereas when it comes to declarative programming, we just describe the what, and that is what we want. There are several examples of declarative programming languages, and they sort of exist at different levels of difficulty. The simplest of which is actually HTML, and that is the language you use to describe the look of a web page. In HTML, you don't tell the browser what to do, you just tell it what you want to achieve and it will run its own logic to basically achieve what you've asked for. At a slightly higher level, SQL is also a good example of this, and SQL is actually used to query a database. You give a database a query that basically looks like plain text, and the database will work its magic to give you the results in the fastest time possible. So yeah, once again, in this setup, you don't actually tell it what to do. You just give it information, and it gives you information back. On top of declarative programming, we have what is known as functional programming. Now, in functional programming, basically the key idea is to reduce side effects. When you're writing a program in an imperative manner, what you sometimes do is you make a function call. This function call actually changes a bunch of stuff, but doesn't return anything. And basically, that is what you want. That is basically what a function is for. Except the changes made by this function is not immediately clear to you when you're reading the code. Sure, you know what a function does, but you don't know what exactly is changing at a lower level. This is called a side effect, and when we have to worry about those, it makes our code less readable, and it also makes it harder for machines to do things like code analysis. Functional programming avoids this entirely by making sure that everything you call is just like a mathematical function. You give it information, and it gives you information back. But at no point will it change things without your knowledge. And because this is declarative in nature, we don't even have things like loops. To replace loops, we actually have to do recursion. So it's a very interesting way of thinking about programming. Ultimately, at the end of the day, everything needs to be a function. So recursion fits the bill. Doing things this way confers several advantages, because we don't actually have side effects, then we can be pretty sure what the code does. It's very explicit. Also, as mentioned earlier, if your computer ever needs to analyze the code, well, it can do so with confidence. And this actually helps certain automated processes like optimizations and garbage collection. And there you have it. These are a bunch of different styles of programming. Chances are you have only been extensively using imperative programming, but, well, now that you know about declarative and functional programming, why not give it a look? 
is a pretty interesting take on programming in general, and even though I would not say it works best for every situation, it is something worth knowing. That's all there is for this episode, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.